Okay. Uh, I want to thank Marina for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think we have a diverse audience, and I, I tried to keep this equation free, uh, almost, <laughs> talk, so we'll see. But the idea is to equip machine learning uh, for causal detection with application to actually, you can call it identification, you can call it science discoveries, um, but with provable guarantees, okay? So uh, motivation uh, for the talk is, I think, pretty simple. Um, so how can we leverage discoveries in machine learning <coughs> for proper inferential tasks? Here the word inferential means hypothesis testing or confidence interval construction, uh, so statistical terminology. Um, it doesn't just mean doing predictions. So this leads me to two main things that I want everybody to at least get out of this talk which is that good prediction does not imply good inference. In principle, they are opposite um, from each other. So good prediction is easy to achieve for various ML algorithms. However, confidence intervals, p-values, proper quote-unquote variable selection with theoretical guarantee um, are hard questions uh, for machine learning techniques. Um, and then I'm interested in causal discoveries, um, mostly because I think a lot of scientists, so biologists, or physicists, what you, what, are, what we all we are interested in, are finding causal relationships. So what is the variable that causes a change in my system, or you know, something like that, right? In high dimension, so all of my problems are in high dimensions. So high dimensions for me means logarithmically, so the sample size is of the same order as the logarithm of the number of variables in your system, okay? Um, causal discoveries are difficult per se, as, as they are, but in high dimensions they're even more so because of the numerous presence of confounding. And I want to say that any high dimensional model um, is really just an approximation of reality, so you al we always have confounding no matter what. We have just been ignoring it for the past 15 years, mostly because we didn't know what to do, I think. So that, those are the two main messages, um, and uh, let's see what is it that um, current work of my group has done. So I have four kind of different topics, given time, I don't know how many I'll go over. Uh, one is on semi-supervised learning and leveraging more data uh, to actually get better causal guarantees for certain tasks. We heard from Samari uh, yesterday that um, having more data is not necessarily better. And I agree, but that's a minimax worst case analysis. So I want to present to you cases where it, when it's useful and um, general maybe. Then I want to talk about dynamic treatments and causal discoveries dynamic in time. This is new ongoing work. And then discovery of causal parents and causal networks. Um, lastly, I have some interesting work on sensor data and that's why the human is there. <laughs> this was supposed to be fun, anyways. Uh, so I'm with UC San Diego. I sit in math department and we have a wonderful new institute. Um, this is a Turkish name, Halitsioglu Data Science Institute, uh, that hires and promotes faculty, and it also has external funding. So it's kind of like a miraculous thing that exists on campus on a uh, <laughs> public school. And I want to acknowledge, you know, this is my slide of acknowledgement of my wonderful colleagues, co-authors, and students. And the current work today is based on selection of, of these wonderful people that you see here. I tried to be gender neutral, so they're all boys on this picture. Yeah, okay, anyways. Uh, <laughs> so one slide of summary of my approach of all of these four topics that I uh, wanted to cover is attacking causality through robustness. So this is a new perspective, mostly because causality literature existed on its own, robustness literature exists on its own, and um, I'm trying to leverage one for the other, particularly robustness for causality. And there, um, so what you can see in this picture, perhaps in, in my graph here, is that I want to leverage the distribution of X or maybe the outcome model or invariance principle. 
On my computer, these colors are a little bit better, so in variance you can actually read, so apologies for this. But um, So how do I leverage these orange to increase you know, something that I would like to do or do better? And there is lots of interventional data that in, um, I want to leverage together with invariance uh, to get causality inferences. So you can read this this way, this way, this way, or either any way you want. So, okay. So the bottom little uh, tasks are something I'm currently very, very interested in, and I don't think we th there is many open questions in the literature, but this is my short summary of a few that I think are really important. So, for example, designing robust machine learning methods, um, or designing uh, methods that are able to have test and train data sets that don't have either the same structure or the same distribution or the same model. All of that is, I think, really interested. Um, you know, it's interested today, right? Because we have so many data sets that we would like to leverage. How do we do that? Um, and so on. Okay, so hopefully this is a little bit clearer. So this is my short summary. So I'll begin by applications of, uh, of each of these methods. So the first one is semi-supervised. So here is a, a simple data set that uh, tries to address the following question. So which mutation in an HIV virus is actually causally related to my uh, drug that, that's used for the treatment of HIV? Okay, so we looked at this particular drug that I cannot really pronounce, but that's a typical name in the um, pharmacies. Uh, and we looked at a <coughs> data set that looks like this. So X are typically denoted as feature space variables for me, or explanatory variables. So I have whether or not there is a mutation in the J position of the HIV uh, reverse transcriptase. Uh, my treatment variable is mutation of the teeth or jth position in the same uh, virus. So basically, um, HIV virus mutates a lot, and if I just focus on each mutation independently, I'm ignoring the confounding and the correlation and the whole system, how it acts together. So what we would like to do is actually condition out on the presence of all of these confounding variables, and we are able to do that, and I would, uh, let's see how we do that. <coughs> Uh, we have supervised and unsupervised data sets. A supervised data set means labeled. I have my outcome Y, which is a small subset uh, of my individuals in my data sets have actually taken this particular drug. And then larger number of patients have never taken this drug. Right, so that's the unlabeled or unsupervised. Is the setting clear? Cool. Okay, so here are results before I show you you know, what we do. So uh, <laughs> just to understand this little plot, these are um, confidence intervals with the little red dot uh, being the center of the confidence interval. Uh, I hope you can see some colors. So supervised denotes analysis done only on the supervised or small data set. Blue around the plot, around the confidence intervals, denotes semi-supervised, so confidence intervals in the presence of additional information on, on X, on the distribution of X. And these are different methods with which I, I use to analyze the data. And this is supposed to be a machine learning kind of uh, approach where I, I should be able to put any of my favorite methods in and get viable results or theoretically provable results. So I have LASSO, I have XGBoost, Random Forest, and <coughs> a neural network at the end multi-layer perceptron, MLP, okay? These are different, so six x-axis denotes location of the mutation, so uh, randomly I picked three, 69, 75, and 151. And what the red, I want to illustrate this red confidence interval. These are the sample confidence intervals. So if I ignore any information on x, I just look at my y, that's what I get as a confidence interval. The idea here being is that if this confidence interval contains zero, uh, this mutation is not causally related to the, to the drug, right? So this mutation will not affect the outcome of the drug. Make sense? Okay. 
So first thing that you get, get to see here is that any, utilizing any information on X is better than sample. OK, no big deal. We know this, right? But if you compare the semi-supervised um, confidence intervals, for example, you focus on these two green little confidence intervals. The first one is using the smaller data set. The smaller one is the one that uses additional information only on X. And this one is, both of them are obtained using XGBoost algorithms, right? However I combine them, whatever I do with them, they're kind of the same. So what we see uh, in all of this um, analysis is that the confidence intervals are shorter, which means they're better, right? They're more consistent in statistical theory, right? What else I'm not showing you that is that we have a corrected finding of the strong effects. So what, that, what I mean by that is that we are now more, so when the confidence interval is shorter, we're more sure of the findings we're, we're actually getting, right? And these are all above zero, so these are all significant mutations. For example, what we have discovered in our analysis that mutation at the location 44 is not significant, which means the zero is always inside the confidence interval. But this is really interesting because if you look at the sample result, the sample result covers, and it's not very wide, but it does cover zero, right? So that would mean that without correction factors, you'll get a not, uh, you would get a significant value. So you would think that this mutation is important when, when it's actually not, right? Okay, so false positive, right? And what we also found is that mutation 10 is, for example, not significant. But if you look at previous papers uh, published in PNAS, <laughs> it's a good journal, right? They found that mutation 10, 20, and 30 are significant. What they've done is looked at this marginal regressions. So they forget about the presence of all other mutations. Uh, they found that these three mutations, or mutation 10 is significant, and, and it's, and you know, from biology, they know that that mutations early on are not, they shouldn't happen. Like, they shouldn't be causally related, okay? So we are able to basically flush out all this, a lot of these noise that's happening with the current uh, approaches. So what is our estimation procedure? It has three little steps. So you want to estimate the conditional uh, mean of y given x, or it doesn't have to be mean, it could be any model that you prefer, but some distributional property of y given x, and you can do it using any of your fancy methods that you like. Then what you ultimately want to do is to decorrelate the treatment variable from all of the confounders that you are possibly observing. So what I call that in my work is orthogonalize my system, right? So make things independent. And uh, you can do that, again, how you do it I'll show, but uh, using any of your favorite machine learning methods. So it could be deep neural network, it could be shallow, it could be whatever, whichever you want you want. Okay, and then you will plug all of that back into an appropriate estimate of the thing that you're looking into. So our approach applies to, um, I would say, univariate properties of Y. Okay, so my example is um, average treatment effect or average treatment effect on the treated. Um, and again, we construct confidence intervals. So not just to be able to predict it, we're actually able to give you confidence how, what is the range of that value, right? So, oh, you don't see the, the, the little colors here, but there is an error there. So if, if I pretend I'm using a lasso for my sparse regression, that's this beta hat here. Uh, this is the estimator of the average treatment effect that uh, we kind of built or corrected. So what is interesting here is that if you don't look at semi-supervised approach, you would only focus on this part without the W. Basically, you would look at that, something like that, or even with the W. So our correction is super simple. It's like this linear component is the only thing you need to add. Mu is the uh, x bar, for example. So the, the average of x's that you have. And beta hat is the same beta hat as here, so your lasso estimator. Um, and that's all you need to do. So I, I do want to stress out that without this correction factor, talking about confidence intervals of this thing is very restrictive. 
It's hard to get. You don't get it for general methods, like neural network and such. But if you add a super simple correction like that, you are kind of good to go. So that's what our work shows. So what are these Ws? Ws are the corrections to account for the correlation, presence of the correlation in, in your feature space. Uh, D is the treatment variable. E is the probability, well, how D depends on other axes, right? It doesn't have to be a probability. It doesn't have to be a logistic model. It could be any, any kind of model you can put here. So you can put a neural network that estimates how D relates to X, and you would put it here. Ignore the case for now, okay? And of course, because I have treated group and I have not treated group, this, this is the treated group, this is the not treated group, and you have to plug them in accordingly here. You have to reweight weight appropriately, okay? And again, the, we construct confidence ends with, so we have a theory that says that you, this confidence intervals here, this is the left end point, this is the right end point, you get theoretically uh, proper confidence sets. Again, dimension of P is very, of feature space is super large. Okay? Yep. So, I mean, uh, as the E hat is just estimate of your propensity score. Mm -hmm. Um, what is, how does omega relate to ri and roi? Because I guess that's not mentioned. Well, it's not mentioned at the moment, but um, you would plug in ri here for the i's for which di is oh, one, yeah. the usual, the usual. So you reweight the treated and the untreated group in such a way that they are kind of balanced. And the balancing is done through propensity score. Yep, the usual stuff. So bottom line, if I don't convince you of anything else, is that you can do confidence intervals and in hypothesis testing. So hypothesis testing means, is there, a st is, is, is treatment statistically significantly related, right, to the outcome? And in this particular setting, this is a causal relationship. Okay. And Good. This is another question. I guess your minus k means you left out that variable when you Yes, yes. I'll mention about, cr it's cross-fitting. Yeah. So lots of you have mentioned cross-validation and all of that, and there is uh, nowadays in high-dimensional literature, we've understood that cross-fitting, which resembles cross-validation, it's not quite the same, uh, gets you a long way when you want to actually correct for the biases. Yeah. Yep. So if you want a general method for, for you know, you want a neural network in this step, all you need to replace is this part, these two parts, everything else remains the same. Okay, so this is a formal statement of the theorem. The only thing I would like to mention is that dimension P, or how estimable your outcome model is, factors in here. And why is this good thing? Because it comes as a product with something that depends on how large information on X you have. So I can make this product super small if I have large M, no matter what the P is here. If you have small M, then the game is different. Okay, um, I have some simulation results. Um, I just wanna go quickly for the save, uh, sake of time. So this is a small dimensional problem, but it's not Y is your outcome, X are your covariates. Uh, we have a you know interaction effect. We have a quadratic effect. Uh, dimension is now very large. This is the sample size. This is the mean squared error. What what I like to convince you here is that all of our approaches are better than sample one. Okay, not surprising, but also better than doing what's called a semi-supervised least squares approach. Okay, and that's because least squares. Although the paper that developed this claims that it's not affected by the model misspecification, what you see is that uh, there is lots of improvement in finite samples by doing a general machine learning method. So smaller MSC than that. I want to show you coverage of the confidence intervals and you can focus only on this line. We really need to change colors. I don't know. Um, this is supposed to be brown. Do you think this is brown? I don't think this is brown. Anyways, so the semi-supervised least squares has low coverage when the sample of your labeled observations is small, which is typically what it is. And that's worrisome but because this is a space where you get lots of errors. What is very good is that our coverage doesn't change, no, kind of doesn't change 
but it stays around 95% all the time. So that's what's really nice. And again, this is highly nonlinear model, so cosine of the sum squared. <coughs> so under coverage, we cover, and, and all of that. What I want to show you is about this little idea of cross-fitting. I can talk about it you know, offline if you're interested, what it means. Um, and theoretically, we know that we need it. Practically, we wanted to see do we really, like what do we see in practice? And it depends on which method you use, basically. Okay? For Lasso, you get better results for uh, in-sample fitting. So it's, it's surprising. Uh, and theory doesn't show that, but practically I, we were looking at what happens. Okay. Okay. Any questions about this? And then I can talk about the other. When do I stop? Okay. No questions or yes? So bottom line, prediction is different from confidence intervals. And yes, we can do confidence intervals. You need correction factors. Uh, and we can do it for general machine learning problems. Okay, good. So dynamic treatment is really interesting. So here is an application. I love it. It's social science. It's my venture into social sciences. So uh, the question we wanted to look at, does democracy influence growth of GDP in the whole world, right, across the globe? So looking at North America, looking at China, looking at India, looking at everything. Looking at, I'm from Serbia. So who knows where Serbia is? Some of you who are older know, some of you who are younger, maybe. Uh, but anyway, so, so right, it's an interesting question. And the data set is quite interesting. Uh, here's a little visualization of, of the data set. So here you see countries uh, alphabetized. Um, China is hidden somewhere there, but it's there. Uh, the dark blue line means under treatment, which means the country became democratic. And actually, economists have a way of computing whether a country is democratic or not. It's not just make-believe. They have an index of democracy. And if it's positive, it counts as democratic. And China was, at some point in time, considered democratic. So it goes in and out of treatment. There is Serbia, hidden here right above Sierra Leone, which became democratic supposedly 2000. And he supposedly stayed there. I beg to differ. But that, that's kind of what I'm saying. It, it's not my opinion. It's the economist's opinion. And what we would like to say is, is there positive growth on GDP, right? Which is what we expect. So what does this uh, mean, just to set it up mathematically for the problem, is that we have an outcome, which is log of the GDP growth. Uh, years are, you see it, 68 to 2010. The treatment is whether country is democratic in any given year. Okay, so these are observations over time. Uh, <coughs> we have covariates about each country, about 230. So covariates about countries are numerous. So these are macroeconomics variables. Um, so trade information, right? Uh, the employment rate whether the country, for example, be belongs to the Soviet Union or, you know, at that given year, uh, and all of that. We have in the data set about 141 countries, so you see a small sample and a larger feature space. And this is the, the graph of what goes on, on, what we would like to allow for. So these are whether you're democratic at time zero or not, at time one or not, at time should be two, this is typo or not. This is the GDP that you're interested in. What happens is that whether or not I was democratic two years ago not only affects GDP a year after that, but it also affects GDP two years after that and GDP you know, three years after that, and also affects whether I'll be democratic next year or not. Right? And whether the GDP is big or not also affects whether the country is going to be democratic or not, because if it's not doing well, the people are going to say, we don't like democratic democracy, let's go back to whatever the outcome, the other outcome is, non-democratic. So this is difficult because it's multiple uh, complicated causal relationships that are happening here that we would like to disentangle, right, and allow. So um, I want, sometimes in, in, in uh, economics, this is called spillover effects, and this is spillover effects over time that we are considering full disclosure, not over countries, which is another thing that exists, but we don't know how to handle that yet. Okay, 
So I want to show you what happens um, if you do our method. So if you look this year by year and you ignore the time dependence that I just showed you, this is the estimated effect of the democracy. This is zero, I hope you can see. And you see basically the gray lines are the confidence intervals. What you see is that there is small to nothing effect of the democracy over time, right? Because, for example, confidence interval covers zero here, covers zero here, it's a little negative here, it's kind of only visibly positive here. So this is very pessimistic, right? This is not maybe uh, what economists expect, but it's also not, it's not accounting for the dependence that's happening across time. So if we allow and we pretend that dependence across time is only five years in time, this is what we get. So the graph, the estimated impact of the democracy is much different, right? You see a spike over here that you didn't see before. The spike in here is much larger. Then if you do it for 10 years or you do it for 20 years, you get very visibly very different results. So I'm trying to convince you, you know, that accounting for time dependence is important and affects your, your results um, significantly. So how do we do that? Uh, so typical approaches for causality over time that you find in literature are these, these are called one or two way fixed effects. I think it's easy to interpret. So GDP today depends on GDP of last year and that's it and treatment. There are no country specific variables typically and there are variables that depend on the country and on the time. This is, um, this is fine of course but it's a restrictive class of models, right? only one lag in time, so this is Markovian structure. Uh, treatments are not allowed to depend and impact the GDP at all. So treatments do not carry over in time. That's the assumption on this models and other ones, but okay. So how do we model dynamics of treatment effects? We actually wanted to do something without modeling the dynamics over time because that's really hard to achieve a right model. It's almost impossible, right? So how can we do uh, if effectively find the average treatment effect if I don't model dependence across time. So in statistics we would call this to be model free in some sense, right? That's the main question. So these are the benefits of our approach. It doesn't require a Markovian model. It allows this very flexible and non-specific time dependence. Uh, it does require on, on something, right? We have to require we have to model something else to, to get what we want, and that's what we'll do. This is just literature, which I'll skip for the sake of time. Uh, but I mean, this, this, this is not a new topic, right? People have looked at this, have approached, but not, not in generality with the model-free approach that we were, we were like looking at. Notation is a little bit heavy, and I apologized. Uh, but for now, uh, suppose I only have two time periods, uh, and suppose that uh, treatment is denoted, observed treatment is denoted with capital D, observed outcome is capital Y, and observed X, the covariates are capital X's. What happens is that I have potential outcomes and also potential covariates, because the treatment can affect covariates, and if I had taken the drug, for example, my blood pressure will possibly change next time period, which would be my X, right? So that's, that's, that's this X of D. So one has to be really, so the, 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 pro, the scale of the problem is exponential in the number of which are called potential outcomes. What could have happened had I done X, Y, Z? And because it's time dependent, it's, it depends on time as well. So it's basically uh, two to the however time periods you have, right? So here I have four possibilities for the pair D1, D2, right? And I only observe one Y. So three of them I don't see at any given instance, right? And filling out the space will not work out for this because the problem is high dimensional. This, in this notation, what is the estimator we are looking at? It's average treatment effect. It's heavy with these Ds, but what it means is what you think it means. What is the outcome if I were under, treat, under treatment at all time points? And what was the outcome if I were not treated in, all, in both time points. So just two time periods for now. What, this is denoted with mu, this expectation. And 
typical approach that you may think about is, okay, I'll just look at everybody who's been treated over time and I'll just focus on them, right? The problem is you only have small sample, uh, lots of time periods. That number of samples shrinks exponentially the minute you want to match everybody who's treated. So that's not possible. So we do a sequential procedure, okay? I'll skip some assumptions because I don't have time, but I do want to, first I'll show you, motivation comes later, sorry, so just don't, don't look at this. So what happens, what is the estimation procedure? We have the observable data. We are first going to estimate how the outcome at the final time point depends on the baseline covariates and treatment, okay? Then we're going to estimate how the final outcome depends on all of the covariates up to that point and all of the treatment variables up to that point. So these are two different projections. You may think about them like that. Okay, and what I was trying to say is that you can, when I say estimate, you can do it through a linear model, which is what I skipped a slide ago, but you can also do it through a machine learning model. As long as you believe it's estimating it consistently, you're fine. Okay? Then we introduce this balancing. So in order to accumulate all of this data across time, um, we balance our data set in each kind of period in time separately. Okay? Balance here means that I try to uh, reweight the treatment and control various variables in such a way that my machine learning methods are not skewed completely. Right? That they're, if I only have 10% treated, and 90% under control, whatever you do to estimate things will be skewed, right? So we do balancing uh, in each period in time. So if I have two time periods, I have to do it twice. So I'll, uh, we introduce new algorithm, how to do that. And then I match all of that to a doubly robust score, which allows me to be model free on how D depends on time and how D depends on X's and all of that. So particularly here, this doubly robust score, uh, it's kind of long, but it's all linear, right? So to explain notation, gammas are the covariate balancing weights. Gamma two is covariate balancing in time two. Gamma one is covariate balancing in time one. This is your prediction for the first model, so this one. And this is your prediction for the second model. So it's kind of like, okay, how does, what, do, what is the regression at the end point given the baseline and what is the regression at the end point given all of the variables and what's their difference? I mean, if I had to summarize it in big picture, that's how it would look for two time periods, right? For multiple time periods, uh, you would do it each period sequentially and you would aggregate information, okay? And balancing are just weights to stabilize the, the estimation, okay? So covariate balancing in the first step looks like this. Uh, this is also called approximate residual balancing or approximate balancing. So this is a high, this is an n-dimensional uh, vector and you have n-dimensional data no matter what you do. So it's not a well-defined problem. So you have to go through something like lasso. We don't do necessarily lasso because it's easier and more stable to do the following. So we minimize the variance under the constraint. This is a balancing constraint. And you can think of these as sparsity constraint. Different kind than lasso, um, but that's what they are. So gammas is a space of probability distribution, so they, they should be all positive, which you don't have to enforce here, and they all have to sum up to one. Okay, so that's, that's easy. In the second time point, uh, what is really interesting and hasn't been done, it's sequential because now the balancing condition depends on what had happened in the first time point. Okay? So depending on how ill-skewed your problem was in the first time point, that's how you need, you have to account for that to do the balancing. So it's really accumulating dependence in this, in this little constraint here. Ignore the mathy constraints here because our algorithm basically searches through a grid search on the tuning parameter and finds the first for which this constraint, both of these constraints are uh, feasible. So you find the point that's in the set. What is also nice is that if you have t time points, you just have to do this t minus one times, the same uh, problem. So you don't, coding is really easy. Uh, existing literature typically uh, talks about 
their estimation methods grows exponentially in time and ours is only linear in time. Okay, so we can possibly allow more time points. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do want to highlight the main theoretical result, which is that we get asymptotic normality, so statisticians are obsessed with this because this gives me confidence intervals, right? This gives me p-value, this gives me provability of my scientific discovery. And the, again, the dimension of the problem, if dimension at the first time was p, dimension in the second time is two times p, dimension in the t time is t times p, so problem is on multiple levels high dimensional. And yet we get this nice asymptotics um, that you know gives us confidence intervals. So, yes. Uh, how would you define horizon? Is it exponential? Good question. No. <laughs> so we were not able to do this asymptotics for t depending on n. Uh, well, if you look at the proof, uh, t is log of n. That's as much as we could uh, uh, require. But yeah, looking into what would happen to allow t to grow as well is very interesting, but we haven't yet done that. This is ongoing work still, so it's not an archive yet. Uh, these are some simulation results, which I'll skip. These are MSCs in three time periods. These are competing methods, and we basically do much better uh, just because it's model free, and the problems with time is that no matter what you model assume, it kind of aggregates over time, it becomes worse and worse in each time point. And I do want to highlight coverage. So you want to see 95% here all the time, and we get it. Uh, here, the total dimension of the problem is 900. So the biggest dimension of the problem is 900. Sample size is 400. These are simulations. I OK. So do I have, I have a few minutes left, right, to talk. I really want to go over causal parents. This is a different total different applications, but I'll pause for a sec if you have questions about dynamics. It's one approach uh, that's sequential for this type of problems. It has benefits. It doesn't solve every problem for dynamics, and you know, looking into this more broadly is a huge open pr uh, question, I think. Yeah. You know, apl other applications of this are precision medicine that I haven't talked about, but yeah. Okay. So what is this causal parents uh, question? So here's what we would like to do. Somebody gives me a selection of genes or gene expression values, and I would like to know which gene causes another gene to, you know, to change or to change the system uh, of the whole problem that I'm looking into, right? So I would say that I'm looking to find causal parents and children, right? So you imagine that they sit in some graph, and I want to find the arrow in the graph, what is causing my, my disease. Is it my parents or is it something else? Right? Make sense? OK. So this is a pure uh, hmm, uh, causal problem that we cannot handle in generality for machine learning methods. So how to do that for general machine learning methods is very interesting. I, I have no idea. What is really interesting in this setting is that not only did we have observational data, we allow for interventional data. Think about gene knockout experiments. I kill a gene, I make it you know, inactive. Um, what happens then, right? So interventions are something that some, at least biologists that I have talked to believe, firmly believe are the way to find causality in, in large systems. And what they wanted to do this is to understand the cell cycle of, well, a simple cell to begin with, but in general, human cells as well. It's the hair, okay. All right, so here is, uh, this is just a little uh, data example, but I, d I do want to show that uh, this is touching a little bit on reproducibility that Marina was talking about. So. We are looking at gene networks, right, that people in biology and physics have developed all these beautifully complicated ODEs and PDE systems, right? So they are dynamic over time. Uh, they're very complicated. And what happens is that there is this wonderful gene net waiver that simulates such a system coming out of ODE <coughs> that's specified, okay? So what that means is that the, you, you're able to simulate, well, there is a true in silico network that's super large. 
described by the system. You're able to, to make a simulation out of this network, which are, which are snapshots or pieces of this network, essentially. And this is what is simulated data. Then we are going to apply our, net, our algorithm for network inference, because that's what it is, right? I'm trying to find a network here. And this is presumably maybe going to give me this predicted network. And then I can directly compare whether it matches the true network, because this one is actually known. Right? So lots of the times in this high dimensional work, it's really hard to, and in causality, to match what you're getting with what is reality. And I think this is going back to like the old ways of checking the, tr the ultimate tr ground truth right, in real applications. OK. So that's what I'm going to show you results under this setting. Uh, OK. So here is, here is such a data set, one snapshot. The network, I'm sorry, we looked at uh, 40 observational data and 40 knockout experimental. Uh, interventional data. We are interested in finding this is the gene that I want to find, that's the target, which means, um, no, not to find. I want to find what are the causal parents of this gene, YNL114C. Okay, this is yeast. Okay, um, we only looked at 10 genes here, and the result should be these two purple uh, nodes, right? These two genes. So, The, the, that, that's in this setting, so that's done in, in silico network, yes. Okay, so there's some model of randomness. ODE model, so, or stochastic ODE. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question, yes. Right, so I want to find these two genes. I know this is the ground truth, basically. You see that there is a lot of interaction going on with other genes that are uh, blue. I should say blue denotes positive, uh, or oh, sorry. There is a name, but I, I forget how it's called in biology. But it's bigger than zero value of, of the causality effect. So it increases the value, right? And you see that what we are interested in are these reds, which are negative, right? So this uh, gene decreases the value of this gene. Make sense? So that's the red arrow. OK, so what are the results? This is our result. This is a lasso uh, path that depends on tuning parameter. Uh, these are the two genes that uh, we are looking to find. And you see that, of course, for certain tuning parameter values, they become active. This is the extra noise that we pick up. I want to share. Lasso gives you always extra noise. It gives you the truth if you're lucky, if you're in the right setting. But it also gives you extra noise. Okay, that's why it's not hypothesis testing. It's not provable variable selection. It's just approximation that gives you good prediction. Okay. But here, you know, you, you see that we find these two genes. Here are two competing methods. This is called causal dancing. This is called invariance predictor. Uh, this one doesn't scale to, even for dimension 10, it's really, really computationally heavy. But we did it anyways. Uh, this one scales to uh, P really, really large. Our method scales up to P maybe 200. How to do it for 2,000, I, I, I don't know yet. So what you see is that this causal dancing gets nothing. So zero clearly is nothing and gets this other one. Well, it gets one of them, I guess. It gets one of, one of the genes right. The invariance predictor um, gives variable results. And what you see is that both of the variables are being at the value zero often. So it doesn't do, it doesn't do good. And this is a, right. So what is our um, method? If I had to summarize it, it's robust invariance search. So you can, oh, too bad. Anyways, the picture has like two little things. Any, anyway, so um, we look for the graph structure that doesn't change across experiments. That's ultimately what we're looking into. So what is the graph that remains the same, right? Arrows remain the same. Um, the value of the errors remains the same uh, in the knockout experiments, in the interventional data, as well as in the observational data. Another example you can think, you can feed yeast with the carbohydrates, and you can feed yeast with a different sugar, 
and uh, you are trying to find what is the, the, the graph, uh, the gene graph that remains the same. This is what biologists believe is the right causality structure for them, right? So it's something that repeats in numerous experiments. I think physicists are not far from, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of what you believe is right. Right, so how do we find this, this invariant pattern? So basically we, we formulate the problem through um, structural equation models. So structural equations are, they look like regression, but they're not, mostly because there's a Y here and there's a Y there. And these epsilons depend on pretty much everything. So they're not really true epsilons, they're just something that you don't observe. And they encode graph structure exactly. So the purple, the value of the purple error is this coefficient beta, for example. And if you do that, what we do is we, threw, we search for, uh, what we make something that we call quantile invariance. So we look for invariance patterns that are robust to heavy tails perturbations, right? Because immediately when you knock out the gene, this leads to skewness in your problem. And we believe that quantiles are quite robust to skew distributions. That's kind of known in statistics. And it was a simple kind of tool that we thought about and it it works mathematically looks like this but really it's all that you need and you can you can encode it if your p is not very large you can do it uh, like this this is all both of these problems I paused are mixed integer programming problems so if you know optimization a little bit um, there is a package in CVX that you could readily use for our code. I mean, we also have the code, but it's really easy. Uh, the trouble is in high dimensions, this is what you would like to do. Um, and we can do it, uh, but again, the mixed integer programs don't scale well with high dimensions. And any approximations of the quantile score that you see here would not lead to robust results at all. We know this in statistics, right? If you have non-differentiable score, it's good for robustness. The minute you approximate it, you lose something, right? And here, it seems that you lose a lot. I wanna highlight not maybe this result, um, but this result, which is simulated result on something that are called multiplicative interventions, which is um, exactly mimicking knockout experiments. Uh, these are the setting, but what I want to highlight is that this, so in high dimensions, the only competitive that we could have is this uh, causal dancing. Uh, and what you see are proportion, how in, in 100 repetitions, how many times did causal dancing uh, select um, as, as non-zero variable one and variable three? The only non-zero in this one should be this one. So it's picking that one up, but it's adding more noise all the time. And mean squared error is terrible. But I'll, I'll stop here because there is no time for this. This has hospital applications. And um, causal discoveries in high dimensions are rich with open questions. Problem is you have to design your target super well. And then we can do a lot and like try to fly. <laughs> Anyways, thank you.